Howdy, y'all. Uh, good evening. My name is Joe Barka, and I'm the president of the UD Rowing Club, uh, which exists more in our imaginations right now. <laughs> <laughs> in the actual context of UD. And what better way to start a rowing club than to have, at UD, than to have the gondolier come in and talk about rowing with the gondolas. Uh, in any case, I'd like to briefly introduce uh, our speaker. Before doing that, I'd like to briefly explain why this presentation on gondolas tonight is relevant to the University of Dallas. To put it candidly, the gondola is relevant to the university because it is one of the most essential and recurring symbols that, lie, that ties together the student's experience of the core, the Rome semester, and the life of an upperclassman. In the second semester of freshman year, students first encountered the gondola in the core in Canto III of the Divine Comedy, when Caron, the pilot of the Livid March, ferries Dante across the river Acheron. Although it is not explicitly stated, evidence in the text, such as the line, his oar strikes anyone who stretches out, notice the singular use of the word oar, and the context of the Italian culture in which he's writing, strongly suggests that the the road of Caron is indeed a gondola. Without the gondola, then, Dante may have never reached the heavenly heights of Paradiso. <laughs> <laughs> After the initial encounter of the gondola in Littrad 1, students find, or Littrad 2, students find it again while on the Rome semester, usually during the Northern Italy trip in Venice. The gondola becomes actualized for the student, as he or she, or he and she, <laughs> are themselves gondoliered across the waters of Venice and experience the city of canals as elegantly from the point of view from which it is best seen. Following the homecoming of a student from the Rome semester, it may seem that the gondola no longer bears significance in the life of an upperclassman until one day when that upperclassman turns the blessed age that enables them to drink at the, gin at the ginger man on the Caroline, they discover, much to their amazement, the gondola has indeed been following their educational journey ever since the Trad 2, ever since Venice. For there, on Lake Caroline, is that familiar symbol, elegantly rowed along the banks of a river in Texas. So the gondola thus ties together the UD experience of the core, the Rome semester, and the life of the upperclassmen. Now, I jumped the gun as a freshman and when I went to the Ginger Man, I was startled to find the gondola in the town that I lived for in, uh, for 11 years. I got a job as a gondolier, and I learned to row, and I got to enjoy the most edifying cultural experience of my life while rowing on the Grand Canal in Venice. So UD, what is the big deal about gondolas? <laughs> Here to explain it all is Greg Moore, the president of the Gondola Society of America, one of the most well-known American gondoliers in Venice, and the lead authority of gondolas in the English-speaking language. Please welcome Greg Moore, gondolier. Thank you, thank you. That was amazing. How do I follow that? <laughs> well, okay, first let me say that I indeed intend to be rowed to the afterlife in a gondola. <laughs> yes, definitely. And you, it might uh, interest you to know that we've been here 19 going on 20 years on Lake Carolyn with gondolas. And we have had many UD students among our ranks. So it is amazing to be here, finally. So my name is Greg Moore, AKA Gondola Greg, because I am that much of a fanatic. And if you find me on social media at Gondola Greg, you will almost always see me with a cup of coffee because it's just my thing. And, uh, and it is gondolier fuel. Uh, how many of you have Italian roots? Okay, all right. Anyone been to Italy? Awesome, fantastic. Anybody speak Italian? Oh, thank God. Because I have what I call watercolor Italian. The longer I spend in Italy, the more the more closely uh, close I get to fluency, and the longer I'm away from Italy, it just washes out like so much bad hair dye, and uh, it's been a few years. So. 
All right, do we by chance have any actual Italians in the room? I'm guessing not, okay. And who's been to Venice? Oh, this is fantastic. So I don't even need to give this. You've already seen it. You've seen it. You've seen it. Okay. All right, all right. And how many of you have been on a gondola? Okay, all right, how many in Venice? Okay, how many somewhere else? Okay, where? Wait, Carolyn. Okay. How many Carolyn you Okay, and I know, I know where you've been. <laughs> All right, so my wife, my beautiful wife, Elisa, and I. I've been on many gondolas in yes. many places <laughs> all over the world. <laughs> She's over the gondola. Okay, We on Gondola Adventures, Inc. That's what that logo is. I am not your typical professor. This is not going to be highfalutin and collegiate. It, I'm really, I'm a, I'm a self-taught street fighter as far as presentations go, and so don't expect much. And uh, I have wrangled her somewhat willingly into running my AV and uh, got my photos together last minute. So now that we've lowered the expectations. Uh, so we have gondola operations in Irving, Texas, and in Newport Beach, California. That is, that is our base. I proposed to Elisa on a gondola in 1993 in Newport Beach. Shortly after, thereafter, became a gondolier, quite honestly, because the gondolier didn't show up. And somebody had to row that boat, and I was the only guy in the office. So <laughs> somebody rowed that boat, and somebody fell in love with it. And uh, now, for clarity, it was a uh, motorized gondola with a golf cart motor and a stick you steered with. So it was pretty easy to learn. What we do when we row takes a little bit more training. All right, we've also had operations in South Carolina, Florida, Nevada. We've consulted or been involved with the training or launching of several other gondola companies in the US. And we know we're talking to all the gondola operators in the US, most of them around the world as well. I'm a member of a rowing club in Venice, uh, was trained in Venice, and uh, most importantly, proposed to my wife on that, so. Uh, thank God she said yes. If she hadn't, I wouldn't be here talking about gondolas today. I might be here talking about how much I hated them, but uh, <laughs> she said yes. All right, planned at least six gondola expeditions in five states, and uh, we have hosted, our company has hosted the U.S. Gondola Nationals twice in 2015 and 2019 in Newport. Very and yes, we do have national. There are multiple gondola companies, which I'll talk about later, and we do get together and compete. I like to say 52 and a half weeks out of the, 51 and a half weeks out of the year, we row slowly, sing softly, and, uh, and it's all about the people in the seat. And for about a half a week out of the year, we row as fast as we can, we scream and yell at each other in Italian, and it is all about getting there before the other guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, so I know very little about a lot of things, but I know a lot about this one thing, and it's gondolas. So who can tell me what a gondola is besides the obvious? Anybody got any ideas? Because let me tell you, there are a lot of things in the world that are identified with the word G-O-N-D-O-L-A. -O -O Anybody? Take a stab. And if not, I do have a We'll go through the list. And there's going to be a lot of, oh, yeah, the ski lift. That enclosed cable car that you go up to the top in a ski resort. Uh, enclosed cars on Ferris wheels, also referred to as gondolas. The housing under a blimp or a zeppelin is a gondola. And because of that, a lot of people in the business of hot air balloons call their basket a gondola. Open top railway car, like if you look at the old classic choo choo train with the engine, and then you've got the oar car or the pole car, that's a gondola. Notice that they're all kind of flat bottomed, long, and they hold stuff, just like that thing up there. And uh, movable retail shelving, this one surprised me until I was on eBay and uh, they were calling store shelving gondolas. I went into Walmart the other day, or the other night, it was right here in Irving. And uh, they were about to close, and there's all these guys in matching uniforms, and they're all super buff, and they are moving the retail shelving. You walk 
in there and you think, okay, this, this stuff is always here. And then one day you go and, whoa, they moved here. It's because these guys did that. And they've got these things called gondola skates. And they have skateboard wheels that pick the whole darn thing up and then move it. It's really quite interesting. Make a great time lapse video. I'm sure the guy at 7 Eleven just grabs his buddy and they shove it across and fuck off the floor. But uh, those are called gondolas. And uh, if you go on eBay, you'll just find all manner of gondola related things and they're not these kind. And then the last one that apparatus that hangs down the side of a building so they can wash the windows, also called a gondola. We own gondola.com and uh, we have been approached by people in the window washing business. People in the train business and people in the ski lift business who buy gondola.com. We've come to realize that it's worth probably more than all of our boats combined. Because <laughs> we got on the internet when only nerds were on the internet, and that ought to tell you about us. Okay, but the original gondola comes from Venice. Can we go with the gondola shot? We have two of them. And yeah, take your time. It is a word that developed and morphed over the centuries, eventually becoming gondola. And this is the original use of the word. All right, there it is, and it's beautiful. And uh, this one is out of the water. This is a brand new gondola that was delivered to a friend, friend's location in Oakland, California. Believe it or not, there's one nice part of Oakland. And, uh, and this is the gondola as we see day. Uh, the first recorded occurrence of the word, it was actually gone to Lum, and uh, it had been used in a 1094 civic writing. Basically, here's the deal. You got a city full of boats. They're all cutting each other off because these are Italians and they're driving. And, uh, <laughs> and somebody in some legal position, of course, there were lawyers involved. Somebody said, hey, we, we need to make a rule. And so somebody made a ruling saying who could do what in what kind of boat, and one of the boats listed was something with that name. And it didn't look quite like that. But uh, anyway, that's what it was. Unfortunately, nobody was sitting around and thinking about how they ought to write down where the word came from. So we could Google it today and find out. The three most popular theories are Merriam-Webster's. It comes from the Middle Greek contura. A small vessel, makes sense. Number two, derived from the Greek conkula, a small shell, like a conch shell. And number three, condylon, a case. Whatever the case, in Italian and many other languages, it's now a word known by the word gondola. As a ridiculously obsessed gondola fanatic, I've heard it described in many ways. In my business, we like to say it is the number one symbol of romance in the Western world. <laughs> Yes, it's cheesy, but uh, it sure makes our phones ring, especially on Valentine's Day. <laughs> a more thought-provoking statement about the boat is that the gondola is the most recognized boat in the world. That is to say, if you take people from all over the world, you present them with, say, 10 boats from just 10 different parts of the world, more of them will recognize that boat, know its name, and have at least a general idea of where it came from. Second place, interestingly, is the Chinese junk, that sailboat with all the, all the posts in its sails. So what is it, as Joe says, what is the big deal? What is it that captures our attention? Why do we always see them in travel ads, on spaghetti sauce labels? <laughs> we went to, uh, we went to an Italian restaurant. They had little packets of Parmesan with the gondola on it. I think it's in my bag here, but I'm not going to dig it out. Okay, Italian roast pureed K cups. Got a gondola on the way. <laughs> What's the big deal? For one thing, it's iconic. Now let's talk about icons, and I'm not talking about Brad Pitt, Billie Eilish, Nicki Minaj, or Honey Boo Boo. When you think about Paris, what comes to mind? Eiffel Tower. London, Big Ben, that big clock. Seattle, Space Needle. Sydney, Rome, an amazing city with dozens of iconic structures, but everybody thinks of the Colosseum. Pisa, Leaning Tower, all right, it's two countries. Holland, windmills, 
India, Taj Mahal, and of course China's got that great big wall. If you haven't noticed, they're all structures. Timeless monuments, unique and recognized, recognizable to us. And yet 99 times out of 100, Venice is represented by this boat. And on that 100th time, it's the Rialto Bridge with gondolas in the foreground. <laughs> the gondola represents Venice in so many ways. But to understand the gondola, you must understand where she came from and when she came from. She is a unique boat that was developed to operate in an equally unique place and time. Let's talk about the fall of Rome. Was anybody there? When, <laughs> when you think of Venice, you think of Italy. But long before there was an Italy proper, and long before Venice even existed, there was Rome. And I'm not talking about the city, I'm talking Rome, the empire. And the area that Venice is in was Roman territory. But when Rome fell, things got bad, really bad. Huns and Germanic invaders continued to come in successive waves of attack, and with no mighty Roman army to defend them, the people suffered greatly. Some of those people in the region would fish in the lagoon that Venice is in right now, and in some cases had actually built little stilt houses to fish from or take refuge in during bad weather. In the year 402, they said that's it, and they started a more serious building effort. Twelve Roman families, known as the Apostolic Families, are credited with establishing Venice with an official founding date of 421 AD. But why would they take refuge on a tidally affected, affected shallow lagoon, effectively a mud flat? Because it's extremely difficult to invade such a place. You can't walk there. Certainly can't wage a running attack. Horses can't go in the mud. It was out of range of spears and arrows and most invaders did not have boats. If they did have boats, they were not likely flat-bottomed, shallow draft boats, and even if they were, they would invariably run aground on one of the many areas where the mud is just an inch or two below the surface, and they don't know about it. Meanwhile, the Venetians did have <coughs> flat-bottomed boats, shallow draft, and they knew where all the shallow spots were. And if an invasion did come their way by boat, they had the home field advantage and boats and rowers who were far superior to their attackers. So, while the rest of the region was trying to survive, Venice began to thrive. They went from shacks on sticks to majestic, uh, to a majestic city. Approximately 10 million logs were driven into the lagoon floor, side by side by side, row by row by row, Whole forests of trees exist beneath that city even today. Driven deep into the mud with stone palaces resting on top of it all. And those of you who've been there, you've seen it. It's hard to believe that's all sitting on logs. If you can imagine 10,000 telephone poles just driven in and then they build on that. So they talk about how Venice is sinking. Well, I'll tell you why. Because eventually, wood rots. And stone is heavy. So the city grew and grew. The need for boats of all types arose. Cargo, passenger, canal fare, hunting, fishing, and of course defense. Meanwhile, a type of taxi boat emerged and was used a lot, mostly by the common folk. The wealthy had horses early on. But at some point, they realized how effective the gondola was in getting around. And all of a sudden, rich people were riding in gondolas owning gondolas, having them built, and of course, pimping them out. And they started to look a heck of a lot fancier. Let's go to the old gondolas. Oh uh, yeah, so this is the, uh, this is what it looks like from my perspective, and that's me. Looks like I need a shave, and looks like I'm running out of coffee. Uh, this is uh, Stella, she is one of our five Venice-built gondolas in Newport Beach. And uh, we remember her because she's Stella, Stella, black and yellow. Uh, <laughs> sort of a Batman gondola, if you will. <laughs> Most traditional gondolas have red floors, some have blue, but we've got a little bit creative. Okay. So the heading we want to go to is going to be history. Okay, there is a 
just started to get a little bit fancier. But you can see quite a difference between that and what we saw on the screen a moment ago. So, it was all in an effort to outdo each other, the, the pimping out, shall we say. So Venice was effectively run by what we call trade families. While Venice was thriving, and the rest of the known world there was trying just to survive, the Venetians, they went out fishing, they went out hunting, and they went out exploring and trading. And that's where they really made a lot of money. It is said that Venice, at her height, had more than 40 families of Rockefeller stature. And if you don't know who the Rockefellers were, they essentially built New York City. Families like that. And uh, think, think of the families they showed in the Gossip Girl show. And those are modern day Rockefellers. So the, the trade families, of course, were all trying to outdo each other. So you'd have five or six families who simply imported silk. They would have, you've seen the palazzos, that first layer, that, that first level, that's where they would bring their boats and they'd offload. Second level, the warehouse. Third level, the business. Fourth level, the home. They, it, was, it was beautiful. They could go to work in their pajamas, but of course they didn't because they were all trying to outdo each other with the fine silks that they were importing. And every category you can think of that was imported with the whole southern half of Europe came through Venice to one of those trade families. They were, at the time, rowed by two rowers, which you see here, and uh, early on, a, uh, a hierarchy and a, a system was designed where you had the apprentice here rowing off the port side, and the maestro here rowing off the starboard side. And here you see what they call a felsa. It's a little cabin. It became more and more glorified and eventually actually had Venetian blinds <laughs> inside. And uh, that's another reason that the, the wealthy people really liked the gondola because they could get around town in a limo with all blacked out windows. Nobody could see them and nobody could see what they were doing or who they were doing it with and there was a lot of that. So they're pimping these things out to extreme levels to the point where there's gold just hanging off of them and every guy rowing them is wearing all these brightly colored silks. And the city fathers said, these guys are out of control. This is actually not good for the economy. They're all trying to put these chrome spinners on their wheels, basically. And so they came up with a sumptuary law. It is uh, the base sump, as in consumption. Uh, the sumptuary law mandated no more painted boats, so they ended up black because they were naturally treated with pitch to make them waterproof. And the gondolier is to wear the standard maritime uniform of the day. So, straw boater hat, classic navy stripes, Donald Duck shirt, and most of the time they wore black, but I wore white because I just like ice cream. Okay, so <laughs> this became the standard uniform, and you will see it even today. Most of the time they're not wearing the marinera, as we call it, uh, but they will for special occasions. And so that is how we ended up with a gondola that looks like what you see today. Trade routes, however, changed. There, were, uh, there was something called the Silk Road, and there were other ways of getting things in and out of the southern half of Europe. People were looking to compete with all those all those trade families, and so the nobility had to tighten their belts a little bit. And we had a maestro and an apprentice. The apprentice got the pink slip, the maestro ended up doing twice the work, and the boat completely changed. And uh, <coughs> the to sink. Um, because of that, the boat started to ride a little higher in the bow, and of course, the gondoliers who had rowed off both sides, now it's one guy rowing off of only one side. And here you see the asymmetry of a gondola in Central Park, New York City. And you can see this side is way fatter than this side. Do we have another image? Okay. So that. 
conversation between a gondolier and a gondola builder. His name was Domenico Trollentine. He was one of dozens, if not hundreds, of gondola builders at the time. Mind you, at the height, when all the Rockefellers had gondolas, Venice had 10,000 of them. 10,000 gondolas. So that's 20,000 gondoliers. And uh, every family, every trade family had as many gondolas as they could field. Because, you know, oh, you got five gondolas, I got eight. Oh, the Jimmy over there's got 20. So, uh, so it all changed drastically. When trade routes changed, the economy changed. And it went from a one-man boat, from a two-man boat to a one-man boat. The Manifo Traumatine, as we like to say, as we're telling people the story as we row the cruise, he was having probably a lot of red wine with the gondolier who said, build me a crooked one. And Domenico probably said, what do I care? You're the one they're going to laugh at. And so he built him a crooked one. Kind of like that. And sure enough, it was easier to row. And sure enough, everybody laughed at it until they saw how easy it was to row. And as soon as they tried it, they wanted to buy it. He wasn't selling. They say, where'd you get this? My homie Domenico, go talk to him. And so Domenico Tramontine overnight became the most in-demand gondola builder. And since, uh, and that was uh, 1840s, since about 1850, every single gondola built in Venice is about nine inches off the center. We like to say the world is full of crooked boats. These ones are built that way. Of course, it's always fun to uh, also make jokes about, I keep they left it in the sun too long on one side or something like that. <laughs> but no, they are actually built that way on purpose. So gondolas also became more crescent shaped. And uh, they, they, they tended to rise more and more because when you've got two guys on a boat and you're both prying in opposite directions, it's easy to get the boat to turn. But when it's just you, you've really got to work a lot harder. And so now we've got a gondola that sits so high out of water that only about 55% of the length of the boat is actually touching the water. It's got a, a very short footprint. All right, you're with me so far. Any questions? So it's stumping on the way. <laughs> So the gondola grew. She got longer, too. Initially, we think that she was somewhere in the 20-foot range. Uh, fairly simple craft. But as time went on, the wealthy families went nuts, did what they did. It is my belief that they topped out at, a, at their current length simply because anything longer wouldn't fit around the turns in some of the city's canals. Let's go to the in Venice. We're going to look at some of the gondolas that exist today, and these are photos that I've taken in Venice. Uh, uh, Venice. Do not have Venice. We don't have Venice. We don't have it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> awesome. I have Everybody's a, expectation. I have a question. Yeah, go. Have you ever been in a fight in a gondola? Like, or like you talked about people racing in gondolas, but have you ever? Oh, like jousting? Yeah, or we talk about it all the time. <laughs> um, no, haven't done that yet. Um, what we do a lot of in uh, in places where we pass each other is uh, we'll fist bump. <coughs> That's fun. Um, I have seen it in Venice. I don't know if you've seen the video, but there is there is a scene a video that went viral. Oh, nice, nice. There's a video that went viral a couple of years ago. Uh, it looks to be a big, swarthy, established gondolier who was who was uh, tired of the mouth on, on this young gondolier, and he literally jumped from one boat to the other and shoved him off the boat into the water. Uh, yeah. There are those who say that it was staged, but uh, whatever the case, it is it's hard to forget. Okay, <laughs> all right, so. Here is a gondola going through a Venetian canal. And uh, this, this is a classic Venetian scene here. You've got a bridge, 
you've got a gondolier having to dock. But what you don't notice initially is just how close he is to this because this is a turn. The bridge is actually on a turn. Uh, we rented a house that was just right there. And so I spent a lot of time hanging around here. What also makes this so practically Venetian is he has not bothered to take his boat cover off. He just slips it to the side. What you also don't see is in the next frame, which I, I don't think I included, the dude is smoking. And <laughs> lastly, what makes it so very Venetian is you always got construction going on. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's get the next image. All right, And this is on the other side of the bridge. And he is pushing off the wall. And they all do. That left foot on the wall is a classic gondolier move. It's even in the textbooks. And what he's doing is he's gearing up to make that turn. And uh, we've got we've got a guy in stripes and a guy behind him. All right, next. There's the guy behind him. And uh, I don't want to be too critical, but he, he is gripping that oar wrong on the top. But what am I going to say? He's a gondolier in Venice, and I'm not. Uh, <laughs> you'll notice there's a lot of interesting sort of articulated surfaces back here. And what when you first step on the gondola, you can even feel them beneath the carpet, which he, for some reason, has rolled up. Um, the purpose for that is it's a black boat. You row it at night sometimes. You want to know exactly where you are on that deck, because if you get too far, you're going in. Um, so there, there he is. And now he is making the turn, and the archway is right there. What do we have next? Ah, two beautiful gondolas. You can just see the Rialto Bridge right there. Ubiquitous cargo barge right next to them. And these two are what we call wedding gondolas. A wedding gondola is called that because it's used on a wedding day, and they are usually the most fancy of modern day gondolas. The hallmark, sort of what makes it a wedding gondola as opposed to Giovanni decided to just really make his fancy, is the fully carved decks. You see, they both got them. This is the Bentley of gondolas up here. Um, both these guys have gone with some really nice brocade or tapestry cloth seat covers. And uh, they've also, one of, this, one of them has a decorative piece right here called a cimier. These are, you know, if you were going to steal a gondola, <laughs> this would be, these would be a good choice. Of course, everybody would know you stole it because there's, there are no clues that are alive. Next. And of course, here we have the Grand Canal. So we started looking at some of those tight canals. And you can see, 36 feet, it's just barely making it. It's quite amazing to see these guys do it day and day and day, hour by hour by hour, just doing it. This is the Grand Canal, the Canalazzo, as they call it, the big canal. Uh, here are two gondoliers passing each other. Interestingly, they pass each other on right sometimes in the Grand Canal, but if they pass each other in a tight canal, they always pass each other on the left, English driving style, because that way they can row under each other's slack. It's kind of a game of chicken to see who's going to pull their oar out, and if they don't, they'll be banging oars, but anyway. Okay, so first of all, it's big, honking big, and in case you were wondering, 36 feet. That is easily twice the length of your typical family water ski boat. Uh, she weighs, I'm laying somewhere between 12 and 1,500 pounds. Seems like a lot, but it's a wooden boat that lives in the water, is used every day, and is rowed by only one person. So comparatively speaking, she is quite light. Uh, eight different types of wood. That's a unique one. There are eight different kinds of wood in each of those boats. And what they do is they choose the best wood for each application. So they are standing on rigid wood, and the, some of the surfaces that need to be curved, those are more bendable wood. Uh, some of the stuff that they want to be impervious to the environment, that's a different wood entirely. The woods are oak, walnut, cherry, mahogany, fir, larch, and elm and each has its own purpose or purposes. Uh, the last one is lime or linden. In this country, we know it as basswood. 
uh, the interesting one, each one of those woods is like the top student in its class, except for the fir. They use a cheap Russian fir, basically pine. It's the bottom sheet of the boat. They know that they're going to be swapping it out between eight and 10 years into the life of the boat because there are what they call water termites. These are woodworms. They eat the bottom of the boat. So it is viewed as a sacrificial wood. And uh, so they, you know, they, they hear, eat this, eat this, because we're going to replace it soon enough. So uh, that's, that's why they use the Russian fur. All that wood is stacked in the corner of the yard where the boats are built along the fence for two to three years to season. And this is to let it age, to let it age flat, because as wood seasons, if you let it, it will move. Over 280 different pieces of wood come together to create a beautiful, unique vessel that is truly like no other. Another way to the gondola, uh, to describe the gondola, is that she is a boat trapped in time. This is a boat that is built using the uh, processes that were popular effectively when the uh, Declaration of Independence was signed. 250-year-old set of methods that they use. And so you can't just take your gondola to a boatyard in Florida and say, hey, yeah, can you fix it? Mm. They're going to, the first thing they're going to do is say, uh, it's made of wood. Sorry, we only work on fiberglass. <laughs> and uh, so it, it's, it's, it's crazy. There's no glass. There's no screws. They use, uh, they use nails that rust. They build this boat by bending wood with fire. They will literally take the, take the plank, stick it in the ground with a big block on top, put a tree trunk here, and they'll put it like so. And to get it to bend, they will take a burning armful of swamp cane and put it right beneath it. And somebody, hopefully with thick gloves, will try to bend it down. And that's how you have so many complex curves in the boat. Sadly, they don't last long. They should, and they could last longer. They do in other places where they are rare, but in Venice, new ones are much more available, and building time is approximately six months. So most gondolas in Venice, they're retired after 20 to 25 years. Almost all of the oldest gondolas in the world are here in the US. Uh, two of the boats that you will see in our Newport photos Let's go to those now. Uh, are 60 plus years old. And it's because they're like cars in Cuba. You, you got it. It's a 57 Chevy, but you can still keep it running, so you just keep doing it. Because Toyota Camrys are not available. <laughs> and so, all right, so here's the fist bump I talked about. And this is a wedding gondola that I'm rowing. You can see the carvings. And uh, this is the stripe door. And now Parker here, he's, he's a surfer. Surfers make fantastic gondolas because they've got the balance and they understand timing and they love the water. He is on an American-made gondola there. Uh, that was built in Seal Beach. Uh, anybody here in Huntington Beach? There was an oil spill there just recently. Seal Beach is just north of Huntington. And uh, next photo. Here we have three. You can see the smooth deck there. This guy was. He was either some really big shot dude or was trying to look like one. Because <laughs> he hired three gondolas with all the trims, all, all the stuff for her birthday, and then he hired a skywriter to come and claim and uh, wish her happy birthday. So uh, <laughs> this is called a flotilla, where we get uh, people in the same group on multiple boats.
traditionally horse shaped or seahorse shaped. Uh, in this case, they, they are mermaids or sea mane sirens. I do, what my mother thinks I do, what the public thinks I do, all those panels are this photo. <laughs> <laughs> you want to you know what I really do? Yeah, I, I'm wearing dirty shorts, a torn shirt, and I'm power sanding. That's what I really do. <laughs> okay, so getting back to the notes. Uh, building and maintenance, two to 250 years old, and now we're going to talk about the Squero, S-Q-U-E-R-O. Let's go ahead and pull up some Squero photos. Squero gets its name from the builder's square that the Squerarioli, the Squero workers, used. It's a bit like a T-square. This is a beautiful gondola that has just been launched at Squero Tramontine. The Tramontine family builds the finest gondolas in the business. There are five squatty, and uh, the Tramontines are the most well-known. If you've got a Tramontine, that's like having the Mercedes, as opposed to the Toyota, or the Ford, or the Nissan. They are, they are all that kind of fetish shit. Okay, next photo. All right, that dude right there is Roberto to Tramontine. He apprenticed under his father, for 40 years. He's a friend of mine until he passed away a few years ago. Uh, his great grandfather was Domenico Tramonti. Yes. And uh, there you see he's putting his finishing touches on a beautiful boat. Now, remember I mentioned that they are all black. Of course, at some point, somebody says, well, pitch is gross. I'm just going to paint it black. And obviously, they got away with it. And so that's why they are painted black now. Surfaces that are not seen are often varnished, so you can still appreciate the wood, and that's what you see here. Uh, and of course, floorboards go here, so you're not going to see that in this photo. Uh, I don't know how old this is, but it's pretty cool. This is the Tramontine yard. Uh, Suero, or a <coughs> more proper Italian term, Cantieri Tramontine. And uh, I don't know how old it is. But it's so old that every man wore a hat and a vest and a proper white shirt. <laughs> if you went to uh, Squero Tramontine today, well, if you went there today, you would meet Roberto's two daughters who run the place. And I get misty just thinking about it because their father died untimely and he had no son. Two girls just said, let's do it. And they do. And if you look up Traumantine gondolas, you will find their website. And they are, pardon the expression, total badasses. Okay, uh, next one. Oh, wait, can you go back? Interesting little side piece. Squero Traumantine? Squero Banaldo on the other side of the wall. I think they were friends, although I don't know. I don't know at what point they built the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I have books from both uh, from both Sway and they are both great. Okay, next. This is a gondola getting its bottom painted, and they tip them on their sides. Makes for a very dramatic shot. Uh, this is a cooperative. Squero. This is where a number of boat builders work together. There is a guy who runs the place, but it's like a co-op that you would find today. And uh, this is Squero San Travasso. It's next to a church with the same name. And interestingly, in that church, you will find engravings in tombs and altars of gondolas. It is extremely historic. Years ago, they just started hanging old hats and throwing old floorboards. 
comes in, I, somebody brought a big honking fan from who knows where. And uh, yeah, next time I go, I want to put something on that wall. OK, next one. OK, here's a bigger, broader view. I want to point something out. If you've been to Venice, you've got a fair, fairly good sense of what the buildings look like. This is different. What's different about this building? Well, first of all, there's a lot of wood. Secondly, they've got these planter boxes on the railings. Kind of <coughs> looks like something you might have seen if you were on a train from, say, Austria down through the Alps. Because these people were mountain people. These are the woodworkers. They were initially brought in to build the gondolas. Squeto people, Squedaoli, especially the people who were brought in initially, they were not Venetians. They were from the mountains. They were, they, they were brought in, and of course, it became their new home. But they just had a very different building style. You can see the brick there. That's more Venetian. OK, next photo. Same place. Different boats. And uh, here you see a racing boat. This is called a mascaretta. The, uh, traditionally, they are raced by women. And they are super fast and rather tippy. Uh, and then the other thing you'll notice is there are, there are garage-like spaces here. That's where stuff that needs to be done undercover is done. And of course, a lot more work in the winter. Next. And now here we have a diagram of the boat drawn by the master Gilberto Penzo. The guy is amazing. He is the authority on boat plans. You can see some of those pieces. So she's got all these ribs, and then these planks, and then there's that Russian fur, and this was bent with fire, and this was bent with fire, and this was bent with fire, and uh, this one definitely was bent with fire. Uh, and then, remember I mentioned linden, lime, basswood. That chunk right there, and the coinciding one up on the tail, which I'm too short to reach. It is a heavy block of wood and it serves multiple purposes. Number one, the whole thing was a coming together of planks at the end. Well, you had to nail into something, and so they came up with this block up here. Number two, now and then you're gonna hit something or something is gonna get in your way and you're gonna hit it. Better to bludgeon it than have it blow you, you apart. And so that that is a dual purpose. And the, the third reason, I think it was actually kind of Accidental polar inertia. If you take two pencils, tie strings to the middle of each, but you put weights on both ends of one pencil and you spin them both, the one with the weights is going to continue to spin more. It's got polar inertia. And you get this sucker spinning because of that extra weight. Of course, the weight of the gondolier on the back and the pharaoh on the front is also uh, going to come into play. All right, uh, lastly, you may have noticed there's a lot of brass or stainless steel railing, 36 feet or more on each side, times three. You would want to do the math on that. So if the boat was perfectly flat, it's 216 feet of brass and a whole lot of screws. Uh, it's a whole lot more than that. Okay, let's talk about the pharaoh. Bring up the, the standard pharaoh image. Easily the most recognizable part of the boat is the pharaoh. It gets its meaning from the word iron in Italian, and if you look at the periodic table of elements, iron is represented by Fe, ferrous metal. And uh, you know, I'm carrying one. This is when I had hair and uh, a couple more pounds there. Uh, <laughs> so uh, do we have another image? OK, the pharaoh started out as two ends. This is the evolution of the pharaoh. He got more, more and more pronounced. This is up in the front, and this is at the back. So at a certain point, the back and the front were the same. Right about here is where she went to a one-man boat. And this is what we have. Piece, but uh, they, they 
started out as screws with roommate pens. This is like an Oakland. And you see the stainless railing. You still can see the carvings. And of course, the bell. So there are six fingers. One, two, three, four, five, six. Gondoliers will tell you that they represent the six districts of Venice. When you went to Venice, did you stay there? Did you did you stay in a district? Do you remember? San Marco, San Polo, Canareggio, Dorsodoro, uh, uh, what are the rest? Um, I always write them down because I always forget. So, um, ah, Santa Croce and San Polo. They will tell you that those six fingers represent the six districts and that this one represents the Giudecca, which is that big, huge island that looks like it wishes it were spring in Venice. Uh, that this represents the Grand Canal, that this represents the hat of the Doge, who was the sort of elected emperor, if you will. And this is the all-seeing eye of the Doge. The truth of the matter is, it's all kind of made up. <laughs> it's all a bunch of hooey. <laughs> made up by gondoliers trying to convince people to get on their boat. A big difference between American gondoliers and Venetian gondoliers. When you take a ride on my boat, 999 times out of 1,000, you have arranged it ahead of time. We don't do walk-up cruises. Uh, now and then somebody wants one. But uh, in Venice, it's very rare for it to be a pre-booked cruise. Unless you've booked it through the desk at your hotel, you are making a deal with the guy who's going to row the boat. And so he has got to romance you into the idea that this is a one-way gondola. And uh, this is why you should take it. And he's got all those things. Okay, so pharaohs, traditionally made out of iron. Somebody realized that aluminum didn't rust, and aluminum became more workable. The fancy ones, like the one you see there, are stainless steel. They weigh twice as much, and, uh, and they cost two to three times as much. Now, when you stand on a bridge in Venice, and you see a gondola glide by, you are looking at the efforts, the product, the end result of an artistic collaboration of 10 or more different artists and craftsmen. The pharaoh, the brass, the carvings and the decks, the ore and the forkle, which we haven't even talked about, the gold leaf decorations, the seats, the gondolier's clothes, the hat, sometimes even the shoes. Yes, there are gondolier shoes. And uh, then, of course, now, let's talk about Voga alla Venezia. Maybe any questions? Okay, we might have to wrap up pretty soon. Okay, very good. So the last thing we're gonna talk about is how to row the boat. There it is. If you can be more of a drone video. So what makes this a superior rowing style is that you stand facing forward, you can see where you're going, you have a high vantage point, and you use all the muscles of the body. When you sit in kayak, you're using about everything from here up. When you sit in English style, you are doing a lot more body, but there are parts of your body that really aren't as represented. When you stand in a row facing forward, it goes from the feet up through the legs, torso, shoulders, arms. It's fantastic work. Which one do you want? Uh, uh, sure. Newport. Has a nice soundtrack. Get it. So this is Celeste, and this is in Newport Harbor. And you can see the rowing. There are a number of different strokes involved. The standard one is this. And then he steps forward, and he can row with one arm. The reason he's rowing with one arm is because he is getting ready. This is a lot of hand control. Mm -hmm. He's getting ready to put a message in the bottle in the water. That he, of course, is me. And there's the bottle. It goes in the water. There is a photographer on the beach. She doesn't know it. There's a drone video, video operator also on the beach. Bottle, coming around, I'm using the one arm while I step forward a little bit. And here is the head. You can see the kawali. She's trying to figure out what the heck is going on. 
<laughs> he, of course, is as nervous as he has ever been in his life. I remember this guy. He, was, he looked like the kind of guy that maybe did something for the government that you would never know about. <laughs> style also because it uses an oral one. So here are the muscles. Mine aren't quite that fucking but there you go. And you see, I mean, it's, it's all involved. And he's got the rowing stroke right here. Next image. And this shows it from overhead. And now this is the most interesting one. You know, the next one. It changes in depth. The water, water is effectively thicker here than it is here. And if you've ever jumped in a pool and swam to the bottom or gone scuba diving, you know your ears start to really, really feel the pressure the deeper you go. That means you're going to get more purchase down here. The English style of rowing is going to just be on the surface. This is going to go deep down in, and it gives him better purchase. Think of it as liquid alcohol. Maple syrup, pudding. And uh, once you get down to the pudding, man, you can fish. And so that is how you row. And of course, a good gondolier is many things. He is a boat captain, he is an athlete, he is a uh, lifeguard, marriage counselor, <laughs> he's the ultimate wingman. <laughs> I lead the league in assists. And, uh, <laughs> so there you go. Any final thoughts or questions? Oh, yes! There he is! There he is! Thank you so much for teaching me how to row. I'm going to my time here. Uh, ciao. Ciao, Greg. Ciao, Greg. See you soon, I hope. So that is a boat owned by a good friend of mine, Alessandro Santini. He is the best guy in the world. Plays electric guitar, looks like Frank Zappa. Um, and he has a gorgeous, gorgeous boat. And when I heard that this guy was going there, I said, I got a guy I want you to meet. And I thought he was just gonna take him out into the lagoon somewhere where he wouldn't hit anything, but no, he's he's right there in it. And he did well. He yeah. spoke well of you, even when you weren't listening. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I could go on all night, but I think this is a good place to stop, unless you have any questions. And I'll be here for a little while. That is a random question. Uh, you mentioned earlier about was it 10,000 gondolas in Venice? Yes. Were those just for, were they like bring cargo up to the, um, the city itself? Those were passenger or? boats. Okay, just those, passenger yeah. Boats. Of course, the population of Venice has has come, come down quite a lot since that point. They were living on top of each other at that point. Um, and also, I don't know how many of the Rockefeller family's gondolas were out at one time, but they say 10,000 gondolas. There are about 500 gondoliers now. I'm sorry, 440 with an official license actively run. Uh, somewhere around 200 alternates. Of them, about 120 are active. Others have other jobs, but it's like having that longshoreman's license. If they call you in, you're going because you know you're going to get paid. This is a very high paying job in Venice. 
these guys are making six or seven hundred bucks a day in cash in the high season. Uh, it's probably not happening right now due to COVID, but yeah, and cash. In a country where taxation is at 48%, cash is very popular. <laughs> the young guys have a BMW parked in the garage for no good reason. The older gondoliers have a vacation home in Cyprus where the Italian government can't reach them. <laughs> American gondoliers don't do quite so well, but we love what we do. Any other questions? You look like you're Do they have like clubs or groups or guilds? Because yes. it seems like when you go up, you know, to, to get a gondola, there's like a whole clan of them. Yes, uh, there are uh, there are um, servicios or gondola stations, if you will. Uh, one of them, uh, Santa, Mar Santa, Santa Maria del Giglio, you've got a good 30 or 40 boats right there, and they've got one that keeps crossing the canal. That's a different kind of a gondola, always rowed by two people. Those are the alternates, by the way. That's washing dishes so you can finally become a waiter. And, uh, and the, yes, there are. There are a number of places in the canal. I believe there are eight places in the canal where you have that ferry type of gondola. It's called a traghetto. It's beefy, it's heavy, always rowed by two people, and not always guys. There are a number of female alternates, and there is one official female gondolier as well. So yes, there are guilds or groups, um, and then there, there's one place behind Piazza San Marco where there are 30 or 40 of them all stacked up. And this is in Irving. This is one of our motorized ones because we do have some with motors here in Texas. If you're thinking about applying for a job but you're not sure rowing is going to do it, or even if you are wanting to row, you will probably start doing one of these. It's a good way to learn the lake, to to gain an understanding of all the things you do besides the rowing. And it is also a very handy boat when the winds are at 30 knots. Now, you hear those guys over in. Las Colinas yes. singing, but the ones in, in Venice, do they usually sing for people? Sadly, you don't have to be a singer to be a gondolier? Sadly, they don't typically sing in Venice. You can get music on your gondola in Venice if you want, but you're gonna have to pay extra for Mario. He's in his 50s, he's got the big gold medallion, his chest is showing, he takes it very seriously, he's got three chins. You know Mario, <laughs> <laughs> he costs extra. And Mario only comes if you also hire his accordion accompanist who also costs extra. <laughs> it's when you go to Venice, when you go to Paris, you want to go to see the Eiffel Tower. When you go to all these cities we mentioned, there's that thing you want to see. When people go to Venice, this is what they've got on their list. The cherry on the top yeah. of And so those guys, <laughs> they have definitely taken advantage of it. There's a reason Disneyland tickets are so expensive now. Because people who go to Southern California, they may want to go to Magic Mountain and Knott's Berry Farm but Disneyland is the one that their kids will never forgive them for if they don't go to. So how much does it cost for an evening on the gondola in Las Colinas? That's your department. Uh, it varies. We have cruises everywhere from uh, a one hour cruise with, with a beverage and chocolates all the way up to a two hour four course meal. So it starts at 155 for two people for an hour and goes up from there. Yeah. And we always say tip your gondolier well because they work hard. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is a fantastic gondolier, by the way. <laughs> if you do the 150 for two people for an hour, and you said what, with wine and chocolate? Uh, it comes with a non-alcoholic beverage. Okay, yeah. you bring your own wine, you can bring, bring your own chocolate. Will they sing? Most of our gondoliers do sing. We prefer to hire gondoliers who sing. But sometimes we get somebody who has a great personality, and we have one gondolier who doesn't sing, but he plays the guitar, uh, and some that just give a cruise. Yep, yep. yep. Oh, here's a proposal right there. It's happening. <laughs> she looks like she's have still you reading. Have an episode where the, the gondolier takes out the romantic couple, and then he falls for the girl? <laughs> no. You know, I get a lot of questions and I have no Actually, we do have a gondolier in Newport who told me recently that he was going out with his girlfriend and I said, where'd you meet her? And he said, on a gondola. And I said, Caleb? <laughs> <laughs> Caleb, of course it was Caleb. I said, Caleb, 
how did that happen? You said it was a group of six women going out for a, for a girls' night. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, tell, tell them about Cole Villa. The question Cole. I get is, do you ever get a no answer? And we, in the history of our company, in all of our locations, have only had two non-yeses. They were both here. <laughs> One of them, she had to go check and make sure she was legally divorced before she could answer. <laughs> like, you know, I mean... Okay, but the other one was horrible. <laughs> Laughed in his face, horrible. It was awful. Are you kidding? I would never marry you, she said. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I, I get off the boat in, in Newport, California, and I immediately call the gondolier because I've heard about this. And this had never happened. And so I said to him, tell me what happened, and she tells me, and 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 she got off the boat immediately. She he, she had to pull over to the side, like right here, and and she probably called a friend or a taxi, and it was before Uber. And he, the gondolier rode home with the guy, and I said, oh, I feel so sorry for that guy. Gondolier, I don't. He's the luckiest guy I've ever met. <laughs> when she said no, that guy dodged a bullet. So, and he, he met her. Gondolier there saw the live version of this, not the retelling. And so my guess is that uh, he was right. He, uh, he dodged the bullet. My hope is that that poor guy met his soulmate the very next month and they've got a house full of kids. <laughs> Dad. So this, this boat is Stargazer. We call her Stargazer. This is what happens when a tornado rips the canopy cover off your gondola and you're left with a, a beautiful steel frame. <laughs> Dad, uh, tell him about Cole, because we've we've never had somebody fall in love with a with a guest, but. <laughs> so we've got this gondolier in Newport. You will possibly see him in the upcoming Olympics. He is quite the rower. We have been very fortunate to have three or four now members of the UC Irvine crew team. So Cole is the biggest, toughest one. He is probably the best crew rower in Orange County, California. And not a lot rattles Cole. He comes in with eyes like this. And he says, I think you need to start with something. What are you talking about? Did you, did you, did you look up the name of that plant with me? And I look it up. Rebecca Johnson? Yeah, that's my ex. <laughs> <laughs> into the office independently and says, that's not my gondolier, is it? <laughs> I know him. <laughs> Thankfully, we had two 630s at the same time. They swapped, and all was fine. And I told Cole, just take a different route. Don't even go near that boat. Do you know that happened twice? Well, that happened Another twice. guy brought her on another cruise, and Cole was staffed. <laughs> 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 You're saying gondolas are a big deal. Obviously, they're a big deal to me, but they're a big deal to Ragu. They're a big deal to the Italian Tourist Bureau. They're a big deal to pretty much every cruise that stops in Venice, every cruise ship company. What do you all think? Well, I think you get to be on the water without the sound of a motor, which is oh, phenomenal. Yeah. You're close yeah. to the water. Good so point. So instead of being high up and far away from it as you are on a ferry or you know, a yacht. Yes. Um, you're very close to the water. I think the, the lack much. of the sound of the machine is a big deal to me. I would totally agree. I love the fact that there's uh, there's no sound. Uh, on my gondola, there are two motors, the left arm and the right arm. 
and I don't have to worry about whether or not the guy before me plugged the boat in, or whether or not the gas tank is going to run out. We don't have any gas in here, but you get my drift. Any other thoughts? What makes it so unique, aside from its history? It is the history of man. It's, there are a lot of truly remarkable things in the world. Bungee jumping is awesome. But it's <laughs> kind of new. <laughs> she doesn't want me to bungee jump again. Um, it's kind of new. Bungee jumping is fantastic. Ferraris are incredible, but they're new and they keep changing. Gondolas have stayed the same. This is a gondola in Irving that is being rowed, so this is much more reminiscent of some of the boats we've been seeing. This was built in Florida out of fiberglass because, let's face it, the weather in Texas is not real kind to eight different kinds of wood. Um, and uh, I can sleep better at night knowing that it's not going to spring a leak. Uh, but uh, that is just a thing that is there. I think, I've described it as a hammock in the water. <laughs> you have to kiss under every bridge, as you see is just about to happen there. We have a marriage counselor who sends us couples on assignment because of that kissing bridge tradition. Because, <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes we need a refresher. So, I think it's a big deal. And apparently you all showed up for this, so you probably have at least some of the problem. Thanks for coming. Thank you. thank this guy for getting me here, this one for videoing, and most importantly, this one for putting up with my, my photo issues and for saying yes 28 years ago. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Fun.